Anthony Blinken's last meeting with Mahmoud Abbas, he was talking about a solution for this conflict in Israel. He was talking about two-state solution. It seems that the official U.S. foreign policy in Israel is two-state solution. Are they considering the Netanyahu administration's foreign policy on this conflict? I, I think since Jimmy Carter, every American president, every American administration has uh, triumphed the two-state solution as the solution, as this is this is what we're going to get to. And very often, uh, the actions of the administrations have been directly opposed to that. Uh, you know, either... Uh, actively or passively uh, their support for Israel's say expansion of the settlements uh the unwillingness to draw a red line uh, about that has made a two-state solution impossible I mean you have 700,000 settlers Israeli settlers throughout the West Bank and East Jerusalem it's just not possible and the way that they have been strategic strategically uh, implanted throughout the those areas throughout the West Bank in particular to make it so that the Palestinians can't have a contiguous state throughout the West Bank, that the, the settlements disrupt that. They make it impossible for the Palestinians to have control of their territory. I mean, so, you know, and there's other things as well that have been done by administrations in terms of, you know, just whether it's appointing uh, their special rapporteurs or their, you know, their head negotiators or head diplomats for Israel and Palestine to be people who have just been overwhelmingly uh, aligned with Israel, overwhelmingly supportive of Israel, uh, whether it's the way that there's been a refusal to hold Israel responsible for its actions, uh, let alone, of course, the the decades of at first economic aid, but now really since the 1990s, mass amounts of American military aid. Uh, you know, all these things had made uh, the idea that the United States is somehow a good faith actor. And that the United States really wants a two-state solution uh, to be, you know, to, it, it's 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 mendacious, it's 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 laughable, it's just simply uh, a, a farce. And so now you hear, as you said, Secretary of State Blinken continuing to endorse the two-state solution, going having these, you know, the, the sit down with Mahmoud Abbas, uh, you know, and having these photo taken and everything else. And it's very similar to the overall insincerity, the the, the disingenuousness, the lies of the administration. Out of, you know, out of their mouths comes the protestations that we support. We we we, we are firmly uh, supportive of the value of all human life, and international law must be respected, and rules based order, et cetera, et cetera. As the planes. Uh, the C-17s leave the U.S. full of bombs and missiles for Israel to continue its bombing campaign, its its slaughter of of the people of Gaza. You know, and then of course, this in the last couple of days, you've had uh, the Prime Minister of Israel, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, when asked what occurs after the fighting is done, when the killing has stopped, what will occur? And Netanyahu's response was that you know israel will indefinitely maintain security of gaza meaning occupation uh, beyond the occupation of the siege of the last um 17 years or so uh but more than likely a physical occupation and whether that's through direct israeli troops there or if they can get some type of collaborate collaboration palestinian forces to do it or some type of foreign peacekeeping force or whatever the idea is that Gaza will be occupied. So just the latest statement, the latest uh, exposure that there is no two-state solution. Um, the the uh, only option I see that Israel is really presenting itself right now, the, the one that Israel wants, at least as you see it from what their uh, people in power say, what the actions of the military are, planning documents from within the Israeli government itself, that ethnic cleansing is the policy. Push the Gazans out of Gaza. Push them into the Sinai. You have uh, the United States prepared to provide $10 billion in humanitarian assistance for the Gazans. What that $10 billion is, is money to help them move out of Gaza and then to establish a massive tent city, a massive refugee city in the Sinai. 
And there's been previous iterations of this plan before, uh, this idea of giving parts of the Sinai to the Palestinians, and that's where they will have their state. And then, of course, Israel will uh, annex, take control of uh, Gaza, East Jerusalem, and the West Bank, what they call Judea and Samaria. Uh, you know, I mean, none of this stuff is obscure. You don't have to look very hard to, you know, what, what what's so glaring about it is how people don't want to talk about it because Israelis have been saying this openly and clearly for decades. Their actions have only confirmed this. And then you see the people who are in power, what they are saying now, this is not historical. This is what they are saying now, not insignificant people, the people in power who are saying, you know, so the, the fact that Tony Blinken and, and Joe Biden and others uh, still mouth this nonsense about a two state solution is, is, is you know, the, the, the delusion, uh, you know, and I think you're seeing a lot of anger. I think you're seeing a lot of anger internationally. Uh, you know, because uh, uh, other countries, uh, the idea that they're supposed to believe this, that you talk to us this way, that you disrespect us like this with these pronouncements when you're doing the other thing, uh, when you're doing the complete opposite, and the history of your actions doesn't give us any reason to believe you anyhow. And I think also among the American people as well. Uh, this is just another episode of the government lying, of the government saying one thing and doing another, another betrayal if you will. Uh, so I, 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 the, the short sightedness of the, but again, you know, we've talked about this before, the people in power in the U S whether they be Democrats or Republicans are chiefly concerned with what the headlines are going to be. They're chiefly concerned with what the lead of the story is going to be. What's going to be in the New York times tomorrow. What is Fox news going to say about this tonight? That's what they're concerned about. Not about what the ultimate consequences are, what the long-term results are. If that's the case, how do you find the reactions coming from Hezbollah, from the Arab states? The leaders are forced by the public. The public opinion, we can call it radically against Israel. Break up of American primacy about the this the the revolt against American hegemony, the the standing up of a multipolar world, particularly say, through something like the, the the organization BRICS. I think this only supports that further. Uh, on a, a related note, I think you see uh, we're going to see out of this a uh, increased interest in nations like Saudi Arabia, like Turkey, possibly Egypt to get nuclear weapons, because right now that is what Israel has to prevent this war from escalating. Why uh, major governments, you know, the governments like Turkey, Saudi Arabia, they will say and they will uh, puff their chests out. Uh, but ultimately, unless there's a cascading events, dominoes falling that brings people involuntarily into war, I don't think we'll see that. Uh, however, of course, that's wars can often start that way. Uh, you know, it pulls people in. Um, but if Turkey had nuclear weapons, if the Saudis had nuclear weapons, if the Egyptians had nuclear weapons, would that how would that change their relationship with Israel? You know, it put them on a par with them on a level. And so the, the idea of, of, of increased uh, military action, the chances of, of a war uh, now have uh, gone because, because Israel no longer has that deterrent. You know, they're no longer the only people in the region without nuclear weapons. And certainly the, uh, that is not far-fetched that Pakistan, because Pakistanis have said things to more or less that extent, that they will give the Turks nuclear weapons. You know what I mean? So the, the dangers that can come out of this in terms of where does this lead to? What is this? How does this increase instability, right? Because the nations will take on these nuclear weapons in order to feel that they have a deterrent now. But now when you've reached that parity, well, okay, does that mean that they're willing to engage conventionally with each other, just assessing that the other side won't escalate to the point of using nuclear weapons, which of course is is tremendously dangerous, and you know could be uh, the folly, you know, the mistake that ends the world type of thing. Uh, you know, the, the um, idea too that you the Saudis, uh, the Gulf monarchies, others certainly the OPEC members of. Of, uh, the, uh, of, of the Arab world, uh, I think, are looking back at 1973 
They realize the leverage they still have. Of course, the United States doesn't import nearly the amount of oil it used to, but the United States is part of the world oil economy, and any shock to that economy is going to have a massive impact on the U.S. And so I think those nations are considering uh, you know, uh, the idea of using that again. And a year from now, uh, as Americans are going to the polls, uh, if there is $7 a gallon gasoline, that would have a tremendous, tremendous effect on an election and most, most, would most likely cost Joe Biden the White House. It and would devastate the, Europe. It, it would, it would, it would, oh, yeah, let alone Europe. So this idea that we can't trust you, we don't need you, we're seeing these other institutions that are being built that we can use alternatively than being uh, part of, you know, as be, rather than being vassals of the American empire and American world order, we are looking at other avenues. Uh, you know, and some of those nations want to reject it completely. Others are are seeing uh, other avenues such as, such as BRICS or other trading trading organizations as uh, complementary uh, to the American order. I mean, so it's not every nation, I think, comes at this differently. But then, too, I think they look at their relationships with China. They look at their relationships with Russia. I think they feel that they can trust China and Russia over uh, the medium and long term in a way that they cannot trust the Americans because the Americans are schizophrenic in so many ways. And the Americans, they, they're looking too. they looked at how, uh, and certainly I'm an, I was an advocate for getting out of Iraq and Afghanistan a long time ago. But the, the counter argument to that by so many in the U.S. that we can't get out because it'll destroy our credibility, that does, and credibility is such a nonsensical term in American foreign policy most of the time. But you, you, I think nations do look at, say, uh, how the United States handled its departure from Afghanistan. They look and they see now as the Pakistanis are kicking a quarter million Afghans out of their country uh, as winter comes on and the U.S. is still holding on to billions and billions of, of Afghan money that could be utilized to help these people. Uh, they see that. They see how quickly the United States is abandoning Ukraine, right? Whereas five weeks ago, uh, the idea, you know, Ukraine dominated American conversation. And in the last five weeks, it has simply dropped that of sight. And I think that's, you know, the, to go on a tangent on that, but I think that's been very revelatory for the White House that Americans are okay with Ukraine disappearing from their screens. That it's not going to cause a problem politically for the White House for them to give up on Ukraine. Uh, I've got mixed feelings on where they're going to go with it, but you know certainly they're seeing that. And so these other nations see that they see that how quick the United States will abandon them, and how quick right the uh, how quick the Ukrainians are becoming the new Afghans. And so do we want to become the next Ukrainians? I mean, so while with the Russians and the Chinese, I think they have more confidence that what the Russians say today, what the Chinese say today. 12 months from now, two years from now, five years from now will still be the case. And they see what China was able to accomplish in terms of the rebuilding or the reopening of relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia, something that has been really minimized here in the U.S. and dismissed, but is a big deal. And so they look and they say, hey, is China a better guarantor of security and stability for our region going forward than the Americans are? Look at the best, all right, what's the best uh, predictor of future behavior is past behavior. And look how the Americans have behaved. Again, go back 40 years, go back to Jimmy Carter. Look how the Americans behaved over the last 40 years, what they have brought to this region. So, uh, you know, all that, I think, leads to this point, again, as you were then saying, about the pressure being exerted on these governments by their people which is very real. And even though they are monarchies, they still have to respect that pressure, particularly something like this. And, you know, the consequences for the Israelis, of course, is they have gone in a month's time from a position where the great debate was, was just how quickly would normalization with Saudi Arabia occur, uh, as well as the success, if you will, success in quotes, over the uh, Abraham Accords and the, re the, the, open, the reopening of relations with, uh, with other Arab nations to now basically saying we have to prioritize what our interests are and our interests are control over the occupied territories. So for us, it is better as Israel, as Israel to destroy Hamas, eradicate it, ethnically cleanse Gaza, take it over, and then have our iron wall, our fortress Israel, 
uh, as long as we have support from the United States, we can sustain this. And then it will be us against the world. And we will be a fortress state. Uh, we will be a nation always at arms. And that plays into many of the right-wing politicians, including Netanyahu. I think for as much as the uh, Israeli economy is going to take a huge hit by having, I mean, because it's only 8 million people in Israel. So you call up 350,000 reservists, that's going to have a massive impact on your economy. You know, I mean, you're, 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 everyone's not at work or not everyone. A lot of people aren't at work. I mean, so you're going to have those type of labor issues as well as other, the other economic hits they're going to take because people are not going to want to invest. People are not going to, I mean, all kinds of, of things that are occurring and we're seeing it occur. But I think that politicians like Netanyahu and uh, his right wing coalition, I think they view that keeping their nation under arms in this constant state of war is politically better than what they were dealing with five weeks ago. I mean, it's crazy to think that way. It's completely irrational. It could be uh, it's almost apocalyptic. Uh, but I think there is a, a, they, they see that for them, Fortress Israel is better than uh, the alternative of having these relations, uh, particularly if it is a question of of does Fortress Israel lead us to the greater Israel that we were seeking? If we were to the you know the the res the, the the fulfillment of the Zionist plan, and people remember just at the UN General Assembly back in mid September, Benjamin Netanyahu stood up there with a map of the New Middle East, where there was no Palestine on there. Uh, Israel uh, had assumed and was uh, uh, the color of Israel on that map was shading in uh, East Jerusalem, the West Bank and uh, Gaza. And so certainly Netanyahu just six, seven weeks ago was standing in front of the UN saying this is what it's going to look like. And now here is a chance to do it. So for him, I think the calculation, this is more what I want then normalization with the Saudis, then continue good relations with, you know, the Bahrainis or whoever. The U.S. today sanctioned China because they're considering that China is helping Russia in war against Ukraine. Considering Russia and China, it seems to me that the U.S. foreign policy, it doesn't go the way that could have some sort of solution. Yeah, you know, you look at the White House and you say, what are they, what are they hoping to accomplish here? Where do they think this goes? And some of it is they really, they, they believe that 12 months from now, people will have forgotten about this. They are hoping, and this is, I think, what you saw was the crux of uh, the Ukraine strategy for the last almost two years now, of hope that some type of act of God is going to occur, that some type of of uh, force majeure or, 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 or something was going to occur that would tip uh, the scales and create conditions for an end to come about. Uh, you know, so there is this, this uh, childlike fantasy of regime change in Moscow. You know, we're going to, you know, we're going to, we're going to use the sanctions that haven't worked for regime change anywhere uh, to force regime change in Russia and Russia. Uh, well, they're just, uh, you know, a lot of people like to, to point this out, this, this John McCain quote, because it's, it's so, I think, telling of, of, uh, United States officialdom's uh, views on Russia that are so uh, disparate from reality. But, you know, the late John McCain would describe Russia as, uh, a, a, a you know, a gas station masquerading as a country. And I think people believe that it becomes an article of faith. And so the idea that it would be easy to bring Russia to its knees, it can't sustain what its military operations It's going to, I mean, if, if you and I had a dollar for every news article that was out there over the last 20 months proclaiming how Russia was about to run out of ammunition or proclaiming how Russia's troops are in disarray and they're all about to 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 run away from the front lines you're like we would you know <laughs> so the these become articles of faith and that's how the White House and the State Department, the DOD, now Security Council, they view these things. And those become the parameters for discussion. Uh, you know, you're not allowed to, to go outside of that window. Uh, and, and eventually reality becomes such that, you know, it's impossible to even continue that line of argument. 
And I think you're seeing that now, say, with Ukraine, where reports this weekend from NBC, and NBC has been a very pro-Ukraine, pro-Ukraine war outlet, uh, that, you know, the United States is talking peace plans with its allies. You know, what would Ukraine have to give up to get a peace with Russia, if that's even possible at this point, because we squandered the one that was available 20 months ago, squandered negotiations two years ago, ruined the whole Minsk II Accords process, you know, so is peace even possible? Are the Russians, as they have an upper hand now, even going to entertain that? Um, but with with Israel and Gaza, you say, well, okay, the, their hope seems to be that people are going to forget 12 months from now and there'll be no electoral consequence. And of course, people recognize that. And the responses are, you know, the hashtag is in November, we remember, uh, you know, and the effect on the White House on Joe Biden's reelection campaign two, three, four million progressive voters, Muslim American voters, Arab American voters, other groups that are in solidarity with what's with, with the people of Palestine. Uh, they're not going to vote for Trump. They're not going to vote for RFK Jr., but they may just stay home. And that just doesn't have an effect on the president. That has an effect on the entire down ballot for the Democratic Party. So, you know, but the hope is, is that we, people will forget about it. Uh, you know, I think there's also the hope that again, something happens, uh, act of God like something occurs that causes a change in the situation that causes right. I mean, there's there's some type of the Israelis are magically going to find all 240 hostages, and that's going to bring up right or, you know, some type of uh, airstrike is going to take out all of Hamas's leaders, and the entire resistance is going to crumble. I mean, just these fantasies, I think, are what is leading them in terms of their idea of how this ends, because I don't think they really have an idea. I think that basically what they hope, hope, and I think they were really happy yesterday because, you know, I was in the gym and, you, you know, you could see the different CNN and Fox and MSNBC all at the same time. And this is the first time in four weeks, uh, MSNBC has been dropping its coverage of, of, of Gaza. Uh, Fox has to a degree as well, but CNN has kept it pretty constant, I feel. Uh, but still, it's there. But yesterday, because Donald Trump was taking uh, the witness stand, that was everything. And so is the hope that just as we saw with Ukraine, that this vanishes. So maybe the idea is you get to a point where the Israelis stop their, their incessant bombardment. It becomes something more uh, manageable in terms of PR terms, you know, so they're only dropping rather than dropping a thousand bombs a day or whatever they're dropping, they're only dropping a hundred bombs a day. And that takes away from the newsworthiness of it. That takes away from the shock and the horror of it. Uh, also to communications get to a point where nothing is coming in and out of, of Gaza. I saw, I saw this, this, this slide that had the, uh, uh, there, are, according to this slide, there were 50 international journalists in Gaza uh, prior on October 7th. Half of them are dead now, right? So maybe that's the other thing. You get to a point where all the journalists are dead. No one's reporting this. You've got you've been successful in having communications blackout, and then other things come up. Trump's on the witness stand again, or whatever things that you know that are going to distract. Because I think the administration has been very pleased to see how quickly Ukraine dropped off the news and how people don't seem to care. I have a feeling that uh, CNN and MSNBC and Fox are not receiving calls from viewers, uh, maybe some, but not many saying what's happening in Ukraine, right? So uh, I think the administration maybe is hoping the same way too, that this kind of just goes to the back pages, that just people forget about this. And that seems to be the hope because they certainly don't want to anger their donors they don't want to anger the Israel lobby. They don't want to anger uh, the weapons manufacturers. You know, the, the CEO of Raytheon on a shareholders call uh, at the last week of October uh, described the uh, the benefit of restocking of the Israel's war on Gaza. So uh, a restocking benefit that comes from the organized murder of 10,000 people. That's how Raytheon views this. And so in Lockheed and General Dynamics and Boeing and all the rest of you that as well. I mean, so all of that, um, you know, does this, w w the, the idea that the White House has some kind of plan, uh, you know, I, I don't think anyone, I don't think anyone sees that. Who was backing Ukraine? The most important actor 
in this war in Ukraine was the U.S. backing Ukraine. The Europeans were following the U.S. foreign policy. And who's backing Israel is the U.S. I'm afraid it's not going to benefit Israel in the long term as it didn't work for Ukraine. It seems that a country like Israel with 9, 8 million people in the long term, they cannot sustain some kind of behavior that they are committing right now. What they're doing right now, it's an emergency act for them. Right. But it cannot be sustained like this. Here comes the important role of U.S. foreign policy, how they can convince the Netanyahu, whatever government is running Israel. How is this sustainable? And so we're talking before about this idea of Fortress Israel, of Israel being a modern Sparta, if you will. And that's very romantic. There's biblical connotations. Israel, of course, is a theocracy. And then you look at, well, who are the biggest backers of Israel uh, in the United States? And it's the Christian Zionists. And, you know, there are more Christian Zionists than there are Jewish Zionists by a large margin. So, so something that there are about 40 million Christian Zionists uh, in the United States, right? You know, because so many of them fill the ranks of evangelical Christian community in the United States. So you're talking tens of millions of people here. And what do they believe? Well, they believe that uh, Israel is necessary uh, to fulfill uh, the uh, fulfill uh, revelations, to fulfill the 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 uh, prophecy of apocalypse and of Armageddon. Uh, that you need Israel to for Jesus to return. To simplify it. And well, what happens to the Jews in Israel? Well, either they go to hell or they convert. I mean, so basically your biggest backer, the, the people who have the most political power in the U.S. that cause this support, certainly the Israel lobby is very strong in the U.S., as are other lobbies. This is the way our system works. Lobbies are able to capture entire aspects of our government here in the United States. Uh, but among the, poli the political pressure, that comes from Christians. And what do they ultimately want? They ultimately want to see Jews sent to hell or convert. That's what they think comes out of this support for Israel. I mean, so if you're Israeli, you understand that. I'm like, my God, these are our allies. This is what they believe. And this is what they ultimately want because these people do believe this. You are seeing as well, too, the in terms of sustainability, the depopulation concerns. Right. So and this is the same with Ukraine. You can't re, Ukraine's uh, 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 economy minister, minister of economy. She said just uh, last week that they need four and a half million refugees to return. Their labor shortage is massive. It's huge. They have such a problem. And so if you do have this uh, resolution to that war and Russia is able to blockade whether by occupying or just by its its military uh, abilities, uh, the Ukrainian access to the Black Sea. You have most of the industrial parts or a good chunk of the industrial parts of Ukraine in the Donbass are now under control of Russia. You have a depopulated country. You have an entire generation of young men who are gone. What type of future is that? What, what type of future is that? You just had last week again, though, similar to what you hear from the Israeli government. You had Israel, excuse me, Ukrainians, again, talking about how Ukraine is going to be the arsenal of democracy, right? That they are going to build out all these weapons factories. And this will be, right? I mean, uh, Zelensky a couple months ago hosted this huge conference in Kiev where uh, hundreds of weapons manufacturers came. And again, the same thing too. We're going to be the arsenal of democracy. We're going to be fortress Europe. We're going to be a modern Sparta, right? I mean, so like that type of, of, of these are, are people who actually believe this. It's just not just the rhetoric of it. It's the people who actually believe that. And so what you see is why would uh, those Ukrainians go back to Ukraine? Your country has been destroyed, environmentally ruined. Uh, good chance your sons are going to be conscripted uh, and put into an army for who knows how long. Uh, the whole place is corrupt. Uh, these right wing uh, nut jobs are in control of the government. Why are you going to go back, particularly if you've been someplace and you have established yourself and right and you have safety and security for your family why are you going to go back what do the what do you owe those people there yes it's your home but the but it would be for your family and you're seeing that and you I've heard this for years now 
uh, about the loss of secular uh, Israelis, the number of Israelis who immigrate out of Israel every year who are uh, not the far right, ultra religious, ultra orthodox, but secular. Uh, and the reports are that immediately after October 7th, you had tens of thousands of Israelis leave, right? And again, most of them were predominantly secular. So you have this uh, increase uh, in population because the far right to ultra orthodox, they have a lot of children. Uh, and meanwhile, the secular aspect of society are looking for ways out. And so you then have this imbalance. Okay, then well, who's going to run the economy? Who's going to run the government? Half of Israel uh, is uh, uh, exempted from being in the army because they're ultra orthodox. Far, you know, um, uh, you know, so they're exempted from being in the army. Who's going to fill out the ranks in your army if all the secular Jews leave? Right? Who's going to who's who are going to be the competent people in your government? You're just going to have these theocratic. Uh, theocratic visionaries who dream of an expanded and greater Israel. They're the ones who be filling it all out, who play into that whole idea of fortress Israel, of Israel against the world. I mean, yeah, so where this goes to, both in terms of the practical aspects of it, uh, how do you sustain a nation that's lost so much population? Where if this massive labor shortage, I mean, just those mundane aspects, but then also too the the theocratic apocalyptic visions of those in power. You know, the desire to have a modern day Sparta to that way, this is how I am going to be a hero of history. Because unfortunately so often in uh, in our in our in our human race, our heroes of history often are the generals, the most violent, those who have have who have gotten benefit from war. Uh so yeah, it, it's a real uh issue that you know, I mean, you look at this and you say, okay, here we are, what comes next? What follows that? You know, what are the second, third order, uh, fourth order effects of all this? And it leads to places that are very difficult to talk about because they are so grievous, they are so destabilized, and they are so foreboding. Uh, and so, yeah, this is if if I if I was Israeli, I would be very concerned about staying there. What the long term prospects are, uh, at, because this what's occurring to the Palestinians only deepens the resistance, right? This what's occurring to the Gazans only, as we talked about, only increases hostility from other nations towards Israel. And so there, and now you're looking at the your fellow Israelis who think it's great. That this is so meaningful that it's it's the U.S. and, and us versus the world. This gives us purpose. This gives us meaning. We are, you know, as they'll, as they'll describe themselves, God's chosen people for a reason. It's just like the biblical days when it was us against everybody. But now we have the great United States as our benefactor. Those are the people who are filling out the ranks of power. You know, so if if you were a secular Israeli, you might say, you know, I love it here. This is where I was born. I feel a connection to the land. All those things that are legitimate. Right. I'm a proud Jew, but I can't keep my family here. This is crazy, you know, and so I, I think you, you're seeing more and more of that. Lloyd Arson asking for more funds and weapons to send at the Senate to send to Ukraine. On the other hand, we have Zelensky totally delusional about what's going on. Do you think that the U.S. foreign policy in Ukraine is helping Zelensky to understand what's really going on or is helping him to be more, even more delusional about the war in Ukraine? I think he's a tragic figure. I think it's, it's like almost like a Shakespearean tale. You know, he comes in uh, and he wins uh, uh, by a wide margin. He gets 70 percent of the vote. And he's campaigning on a peace plan that he is going to go talk to Vladimir Putin. He's going to end the war in eastern Ukraine. Uh, that's his that's his campaign promise. And that's why people vote for him. And then when he comes into office, he's confronted by the right wing, by the ultranationalists, by the neo-Nazis, uh, you know, who put a depending on how much story you believe, they either put a gun to his head or they show him the tree they're going to hang him from. And then the Americans and the British come in and they say, uh, you know, remember what happened in 2014, uh, you know, just uh, uh, what happened to Yanukovych can happen to you. Uh, the coup can happen here again. And unlike then, you won't have, unlike Yanukovych, who was able to flee to Russia, you won't have anywhere to go. Uh, but here's the deal. We can make you into, again, a hero of history. We can make you into the man who stood up 
to Russia, who stood up to Vladimir Putin. We will build up your army and we will make you a, a, a great and powerful figure in Europe and in the world. And he attaches on to that. And then we know, of course, uh, year three years of, of of provocations, three years of a dismissal of negotiations, uh, and Russia then launches its invasion in February 2022. And immediately, uh, the uh, Ukrainians and the Russians enter into negotiations, uh, just most recently confirmed by Gerhard Schroeder, uh, the former chancellor of Germany, who was involved with this. I mean, so the documentation and the evidence and the verification of this is just is, is, is immense that these negotiations happened right away between Ukraine and Russia, uh, that they produced a draft peace plan. And then the Americans and the British came in and said, we're not ready for this. You're not ready for this. And you're going to pull out of this and we're going to give you everything you need to win this war. You will not just be any hero of history. You're going to be the Churchill of modern history, right? And so they offer that to, or they tell that to Zelensky because according to Gerhard Schroeder, uh, the Ukrainians did want to negotiate for peace. Uh, we're on their way towards it, uh, but they couldn't make any decisions on their own. All decisions came from Washington, according to Schroeder. Uh, and this is very. This is backed up by what we've heard from others: Naftali Bennett, the former uh, Israeli Prime Minister, the Turkish Foreign Minister. You know, by even by people like Fiona Hill, the former American National Security Council uh, member. Uh, you know, writing in Foreign Affairs, and this is reported by Reuters and BBC and and others. I mean, there's no, there should be no argument about this. Uh, what you see though in the United States about this is a complete refusal to accept it, a complete refusal to engage on it. It's this uh, to talk about the negotiations between Russia and Ukraine uh, in the early parts of the war is strictly forbidden in the American political and media landscape. If you do bring it up, you looked at it if you're, you're crazy. And then when you say, well, here's here's all the evidence, here's your own, you know, come on, your own people, Reuters, you guys talked about this uh, and then you're just ignored. Um, and so, but, you know, I, so I think what happens is Zelensky's promised all this. And I think this type of pressure on him, this chance to be the Churchill's era, to play his greatest role, because remember he was an actor. I mean, so to be on the stage like this, I think, and then to the pressures of the war, uh, how the mass, mass amounts of casualties, destruction have affected him personally. Uh, we don't know this, you know, but it leads to the point that we now have uh, members of his own staff describing him as delusional, that he's the only one who thinks this war is still winnable, that you can't say anything otherwise to him. You know, so you have this, this according to these reports from mainstream media, uh, you know, like Time Magazine, like The Economist. So so publications and outlets that were very friendly, very supportive of the Ukrainian government, you know, reporting on this descent into madness, basically. Uh, you know, and, and so uh, the, the, the problem you run into there then is, is this is the person that you have propped up. This is being your front man. This is the, the, the person that you have championed around the world that you have made sure has been on the cover of every magazine on, right? I mean, he's had, uh, but you know, we had seen going into this fall already a uh, diminishment of support from Zelensky. When he came to the United States in September, he received a cold shoulder. Whereas last year he had a, he addressed a joint session of Congress. Uh, this, this time a uh, closed door meeting with members of Congress, many of whom didn't attend. Many showed up late, disrespecting him. So, I mean, you have this tragic figure with Zelensky who's in control now. You're starting to see um, desires by, more open desires by Western governments to find a way out of this, uh, you know, and certainly the United States and others have the ability to remove Zelensky. We've done it before. Plenty of, of American figurehead leaders have been deposed. That's not an issue question of whether or not it can be done in a manner that doesn't make things worse, right? So can you remove Zelensky without causing a general collapse that runs down through the, the government, uh, that runs down through the military, that doesn't give Russia some type of advantage, and also too doesn't further weaken Western support for the war, uh, particularly in the American Congress and among the American people. But you've certainly seen that in terms of the public opinion polls that have come out. One came out last week, I believe from Gallup, 
that talked about where the American public was now in terms of this war. And you've just seen the trend, just constant, very clear of people turning away from this war. So, you know, you have uh, a plurality of Americans say that the United States has done too much for Ukraine. Right. I mean, so even with the most uh, up until I think the Israeli Gazan war, uh, the Ukraine Russian war was the most propagandized war of our lifetimes. Uh, even with all of that, you now have this point where the 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 moral reality of the war, the, the practical reality of the war has made it so that support just continues to to erode and erode and erode. And this you so you have this problem now of what do you do about Zelensky? What do you do about it? And it was very similar, I think, to what the Americans went through with in Afghanistan with what do we do about Karzai? This guy is no longer controllable. We, we've got issues with with him. We don't think he thinks straight. You know, he's not a reliable actor anymore. He's not going to stay on script. We can't manage him. What do we do about him? You know, in a sense of with Karzai, they were able to to run elections that got Ghani in, who was equally as capable and competent as Karzai was. You know, but uh, I mean, so yeah, the, these are the types of concerns that. The White House, the National Security Council, the State Department, the CIA, the Department of Defense, I think are all considering uh, with regards to Zelensky. And I think there's a great relief that Israel Gaza is going on right now because that distracts from uh, Ukraine. ABC News poll shows that 76% of Americans believe that the country is on the wrong direction. 76% is too much for Joe Biden getting reelected. Yeah. How much of this comes from the U.S. foreign policy? Let's put it th this way. And how much of this, in your opinion, is from the U.S. domestic policy? I think it's a mix and it's hard to pull apart, you know, because it's, it's so intertwined. It's been so intertwined for so long, particularly since uh, the end of the Second World War. Uh, this uh, predominance of uh, American investment in a militarized foreign policy at the expense of uh, not just a diplomatic foreign policy, but uh, investments in the United States proper. Uh, so there are very real trade-offs. Uh, you know, people will say, well, the defense budget really doesn't take up that much compared to Social Security and compared to Medicare and Medicaid. But those are all, first of all, that's a bad comparison because both Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid are paid for through direct taxation, right? So they come out of your payroll taxes. Everyone looks at their their, their their paycheck or their pay sheet, and there it is. Here's the reductions for Social Security and for Medicare and Medicaid. So they're directly paid for. Qu questions about their solvency and, and everything else, fairness, how good they are, another issue. But but so you look and you say at the amount of money the U.S. has spent on its wars and its military, and you look that since 9-11 in particular, we've spent more than $16 trillion on the Pentagon since 9-11. Uh, you look at the fact we've spent $8 trillion on the Iraq and Afghan wars, uh, half of that money going to weapons contractors. And you say, what are the opportunity costs? You know, the, the defense budget uh, defense budget in 2001 was about $300 billion. It's now almost $900 billion. You know, the, the Department of Veterans Affairs budget was below, was about $80 billion, I think, in 2001, maybe not even that much. Now it's over $300 billion. You know, I mean, the amount of money we spend every year on our intelligence services is about $100 billion. Homeland Security, the fact that the State Department, which gets about 50 or $60 billion a year, spends most of their time selling weapons to other nations. The fact that the second biggest export of the U.S. now are weapons. You know, we we exported $205 billion in weapons last year. We exported $195 billion in agricultural products. So we export more weapons than we do food. I mean, all these, this has a real impact, the opportunity costs. So you look at the growth in the defense budget over these last 20 years, the, 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 and the, the, full plunging into a militarized foreign policy. That's one of the few things that Congress can agree upon. And then you look at, well, what has been the investments in the United States itself? And you see that in terms of the federal spending, uh, everything besides, not everything that hasn't been defense or veterans related has remained flat or has declined on sp in spending levels, even as we've grown by 50 million people in this country. So, you know, you then have the opportunity costs of like, what could we have done with this money? 
you know, to have completely uh, uh, rebuilt our energy grid, you know, and plunge fully into a, a green energy program and, and, you know, 20 years on, where would we be with that? Well, that would have cost four and a half trillion dollars. And again, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan cost eight trillion. And I know a lot of people don't agree with that's the right way to go, but that's just an example of what we could have done. I remember years ago when I was speaking out against the Afghan war and, uh, you know, a couple of different things would come up. And, you know, whenever I would go and speak in a town, whether I was going to say Newark, New Jersey, or I was going to Tulsa, Oklahoma, this was like 2009, 2010, 2011, during the Great Recession, I would simply look up, okay, Tulsa, Oklahoma, police department layoffs, uh, Google fire department layoffs, hospitals shutting down. And sure enough, I would go and I'd speak in Tulsa and I'd say, hey, you all just laid off 100 firefighters and cops in the last few months. Do you know how much money is going to the Afghan police right now? I mean, so like that type of trade-off, that type of op lost opportunity cost. Uh, you know, I remember my favorite one was I used to take the train a lot from D.C. to New York. And, you know, the, the cost of, of putting in high speed rail between D.C. and New York was one hundred billion dollars. What were we spending on Af on the Afghan war that year? A hundred billion dollars. I mean, so the, like in people I know, I, I, hey, I'm a MMT person. Uh, it's not like we've got one box of money, money coming in, another money, go, you know, one pot, whatever comes in, goes out. I get all that. However, in our politics, in our media, how people view this, remember, most people, uh, the way it's often presented politically and in the media is like they refer to the federal budget as if it's like a household budget, which is just simply inane, no relation whatsoever. But that's the reality of how people perceive it. That's how it's talked about. That's how it's understood. So this allows, this type of spending has allowed for politicians to say, we can't afford it. We can't afford to increase our support for uh, health care, to increase our support for education, to do more about the climate. We can't afford it. $40 billion. We have 2,000 communities here in the United States that have lead in their pipes, right, in their drinking water. It would cost about $40 billion to replace all those. Huge amount. But $40 billion is less than 5% of the defense budget. Right. I mean, so it's just but we can't afford it. So the impact on the American public and our society, particularly our economy, uh, has been dramatic and it's not well understood. It's not well spoken of. It's it's you do have to dig a little to understand how does spending uh, nine hundred billion dollars on defense uh, industry and the Pentagon impact my life here in Wake Forest, North Carolina, but it's there, particularly when you look at in the long term decisions that are made for where money goes to. And it speaks to the soul of the country. Years ago, uh, before 9-11, the wealthiest parts of the country in the United States were New York. It was uh, Dallas and Tulsa because of the oil and gas, it was Silicon Valley, you know, different places that produce things. And there's a reason. Oh, it make, makes total sense. That's the wealthiest part of the country. Since 9-11, since about 2003 or 2004 or so, the wealthiest part of the United States has been Washington, D.C. and its suburbs. Uh, depending upon what report you look at, what article you read, uh, four of the six wealthiest counties are D.C. suburbs, seven of 10 are D.C. So whatever it is, you see that wealth is concentrated around Washington, D.C. And Washington, D.C. simply takes in and then distributes and again, where has this money been going through? Whether the bank bailouts and certainly COVID relief, but this is well underway before uh, the bank bailouts, before TARP, right? Before the COVID relief, this has been occurring for 20 years. And we look at, again, the federal budget, which is really the only explainer for that region, uh, for, you know, that Versailles that we have basically $4 trillion a year going out. Well, you know, it's all defense related. It's all Pentagon related. It's all intelligence related, you know, because we're not spending the money as we once did on other aspects of our economy. Again, all non-defense related spending since 2001 has either remained flat or has actually decreased. So this wealth propagation in D.C. has come because of the wars, because of the Pentagon and not because of, of any other reason. And so, I mean, you, I think when you understand that, you look at that, you say, my God, what kind of other country could we have if we didn't have this militarized foreign policy, if we didn't have this 
uh, uh, military industrial complex. And, you know, whether or not you're a socialist like me and you want to provide for health care and education to people, want to address climate change, or you're like my libertarian friends who say that money should be given back to the people. That's an argument we can have. But we all, I think, are in agreement that what we're doing right now is very destructive. It has been destructive and it will continue to be destructive. What's the logic behind these military bases? How much of this budget that goes to the Defense Department goes to these 800, if I'm not mistaken, military bases all around the world? I think it's something about $100 billion a year is what they kind of, what's, what's calculated as what that takes up, those overseas military bases. Uh, you know, the United States' overseas military bases, which we account for, the U.S. accounts for about 95% of the world's overseas military bases. So where we have 800 plus military bases overseas, the rest of the world has about 40 or something like that total around the world, you know, um, many of whom are U.S. allies like Britain. And the United States has overseas bases. It has overseas territories and colonies prior to the Second World War. United States has always been an empire. You know, I mean, you might not want to consider it that way, but certainly expansion across North America was the expansion of an empire. Uh, and then after World War II, as the last nation standing, basically, as the only nation in the world, industrialized nation in the world, that was left unscathed. I guess you could make the argument for Canada, but Canada is relatively small. But the uh, idea that everyone else had been destroyed, everyone else had to rebuild and really rebuild. The United States came out of World War II even stronger than it was when it entered. I mean, yes, 400,000 dead, a lot of casualties, but... Uh, the industrial capacity of the United States compared to where it was years, five years before was, and again, the only industrial power in the world that didn't have to rebuild. And so the United States, already an empire, fills in throughout the world and becomes the great empire that it is now. Uh, and of course, you go through the Cold War. And so what you have now with these bases is a legacy of that. And the bases are uh, the bases are a physical embodiment of the empire, a physical embodiment of American hegemony, physical embodiment of American primacy. They signal to the world that we are in charge. They have tremendous impacts uh, uh, in these countries, economic impacts. They provide assurances. They provide pressure. They supposedly provide stability. I think that's pretty debatable. I think most people would agree with that, you know, particularly over the last last few decades. Uh, but it also allows for the power projection. So it allows for the launching of invasions of countries like Iraq and Afghanistan. It allows for punitive raids and expeditions. It allows for extrajudicial assassinations through our drones and commandos. It threatens other nations. So it's a cudgel. It is a uh, 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 where, you know, it is another form of approach for uh, ensuring extraction from the developing world, uh, because we are the stick to the carrot of the IMF, if you will, in the World Bank. And even that carrot's a poison carrot, because as we know, those loans are so ruinous to nations. Uh, so that provides all these services of empire. What kind of empire would we be if we didn't have these bases? Uh, so that's the purpose. And then what president is going to come in and be the one to shrink that, right? I mean, even we saw Bill Clinton had the opportunity to do it. Uh, and certainly U.S. overseas presence dropped considerably uh, after the end of the Cold War. But still, we have 800 military bases. But I mean, like, so it didn't, I mean, it was only... The, the drop was only so great because the number was so massive. Uh, and again, hardly anyone else has overseas military bases, but this is what makes us the empire. This is what makes us the indispensable nation or the exceptional nation. This is what we're able to uh, either threaten nations with, which is most of the world now, and provide some degree of security to our friends and allies, which is increasingly dwindling. And you do have to look at it and say, what benefit comes from it? It's a tremendous suck on the economy, can you can you argue that this expenditure uh, is less than, or can you argue this expenditure uh, provides the benefits of itself? 
right? Do we get back in return for what we're investing in this? Uh, but then also to, and then diplomatically, we see that, you know, uh, uh, this is not going to cause nations to follow us on everything. Uh, you know, the vote uh, in the UN General Assembly a couple of weeks ago on a ceasefire in Gaza, uh, United States had the support of uh, 13 other nations. Uh, none of them were our major allies. One of them, of course, was Israel. Most of them were uh, tiny uh, Asian uh, Pacific Asian nations that were uh, that are wards of the United States that are entirely dependent upon the United States funding them. Otherwise, they will be, you know, uh, unable to survive. Uh, that's, you know, and then we had Austria and I think the Czech Republic or no, Austria and, Hung and Hungary, Hungary, maybe. Yeah, Hungary. Yeah. And that was it. That was the coalition that the United States was able to assemble to support Israel. And then, of course, last week, every year, this has occurred for 30 plus years, the entire world votes against, including those nations that would sink into the Pacific Ocean if it wasn't for the United States, uh, that, you know, everyone votes against the United States' embargo, its blockade of Cuba, except, of course, for Israel. And this is what, the 35th year in a row that's happened or something like that. So what does this actually achieve? And how much of it is is a waste and a drain and a hindrance? And, and then again, it's also too exhibit A, for as we talked about earlier, for these nations who want to find alternatives to the American uh, empire, to the American world order, right? Who want to find things that they can use to bypass, who want to form their own multipolar world that's more representative of them, that don't want to keep taking orders from the United States, that don't want their lectures, that doesn't want the United States' drones and commandos. I mean, so there, that is, you know, how much of a harm does that uh, produce as well? Uh, because, you know, as we talk about this, we have to always be cognizant of what comes next. What what a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now? Again, as we were talking before, what we're seeing right now, does this mean five years from now, Turkey and Saudi Arabia both have nuclear weapons? I mean, these are the kinds of things that are just simply not discussed or thought about or debated in the White House, in the executive office building, at the State Department, at the Pentagon, at Langley, um, because it's this is outside the parameters of what they really care about, which as I said before, are tomorrow's headlines. You know, tomorrow's uh, what what is what is MSNBC going to say about this tomorrow? I think with this conflict in Israel, Saudi Arabia, we're always talking about if Iran gets nuclear bombs, we're going to get it. But I think they are considering Israel as well. The concern is when you have a uh, White Houses that are dominated and the top uh, the top levels of the executive agencies are dominated by people that come out of political campaigns, they view everything as political campaigns. So they often present things in mannequin in terms of good versus evil. Everything is always against the other. There's always an opponent that you need to demonize. You can never agree with them in any way. There can be no nuance. Everything has to be black and white. So everything is spoken about, calculated, presented as if it's a political campaign. And the way you talk about things and what you're allowed to publicly say influences your private conversations. Now, I'm not talking about conversations between one and two individuals, but I'm talking about what happens in the conference room. You know, and I can tell you this firsthand, you know, when you, when you have, say, a policy like where you've invaded Iraq, you're occupying Iraq, but you are forbidden from saying what you are doing as an occupation, that has very real effects on how things are planned, how things are determined, how it has a real wearisome effect on the mental and emotional health of people because they're in such a dissonance with reality where we are occupying them, but I'm not allowed to say it. And that has real issues, I think, on people uh, in terms of, you know, both on the individual and institutional level, because you're living a lie, you're acting out a lie. But also, too, it's, it's just, if you're not allowed to describe the occupation as an occupation, if you and I saw this a number of times, you would go into these briefings and they would talk about the insurgencies. And uh, first of all, you could, God forbid, God help you if you describe the insurgency as resistance. But the other thing would be that they would, if I saw this once, I saw it a dozen times, uh, you know, a PowerPoint presentation 
uh, talking about the insurgencies and they're briefing the three star general or whoever, the ambassador uh, about the motivations and nowhere on that slide. I swear to God, nowhere on that. I saw this multiple times. Nowhere on that slide is the motivation that the insurgency is based upon occupation. It's all about their uh, uh, their ideological, their religious, their dead enders, their holdovers, holdovers from the Ba'athist government, right? Their holdovers from the Taliban regime. Uh, that there are criminal elements involved here, that these are just really armed gangs with a sophisticated marketing slogan about national liberation. I mean, you saw all those, and some of that was all true. That was present in the resi- in the, uh, in the insurgencies, in the resistance. But the chief thing, the thing that we knew, why people were fighting us, why they were, they were willing to die, was because we were occupying them, and that was not allowed to be spoken. I mean, that doesn't, I don't, Feel I feel like I don't start seeing that until 2005 or so. People starting to talk about that openly in actual meetings and such. And certainly, when I'm just talking about here in terms of seeing a slideshow where these intelligence officers are describing the insurgency, I saw that in 2008 in Washington D.C. and saw that in 2009 in Afghanistan. Right, leaving out the whole occupation piece, leaving out the fact that you know you shot up that car and killed my brother and his family. The fact that I just had to witness my mom get humiliated going through a checkpoint by foreign soldiers, you know, uh, let alone all the other reasons why you would be against occupation. You know, when you're not allowed to say those things. Right. And so I think that causes this type of dysfunction. That's why we're having this conversation saying, like, how could these people think this way? What do they think is going to happen? Well, this is why this is why how it gets like that, because. They have these parameters placed on themselves. And again, they are nothing more than than politicians.